friends, I'm Jill Morricone. We look forward to this time when we get to open up the Word of God and study with you for the Sabbath School panel. I can't believe we're in lesson number seven, unto the least of these. Want to introduce your family, my family here at the table. To my left, Brother Ryan Day, so glad you're here. Amen, I'm excited to be here and I actually have uh, Monday's lesson entitled God's Provision for the Poor. Wonderful. In the middle, Pastor John Lomacane, glad you're here. Yes, I have the rich young ruler. Wow, we're going to talk a lot about him. <laughs> Sounds like a great study. Brother John Denzi, so glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here. I'm talking about another rich individual named Zacchaeus. Oh, I like that. Then last but not least, Brother Daniel Perrin, who's a newer member of the Sabbath School panel family, and we're so glad you're here. And I get to help you consider another rich man. Consider the man Job. Oh, wonderful. Well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. And Daniel, would you pray for us? Be happy to. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, it's your word that we desire to not only change our minds and our hearts, but change our priorities and our actions. And Lord, as we study today, fill us with the heart that you have, a heart that cares for those around us because you cared for us. Thank you for leading us in this discussion, in this study today, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're looking at lesson number seven, unto the least of these. There's at least the lesson brought out, there's at least four individuals mentioned in scripture called the least of these. Now I'm gonna read a couple Bible verses and let's see if we can find out who those individuals are. First one is James 1, 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So who are the least of these in that passage? The orphans, uh-huh, and the widows. Yes, the orphans and the widows. So those are two. Let's read another verse. Deuteronomy 24, verse 17. You shall not pervert justice due to the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. There's three mentioned in that mm -hmm. passage. Any guesses what they were? Stranger. Stranger, fatherless. yes. Stranger, fatherless. Now, fatherless and orphans are kind of used synonymously. And widows. Now we're going to look at Zechariah 7, 9 and 10, and you see all four of them mentioned here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Now here it's referenced as alien, but it could also be stranger. Mm -hmm. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Those four groups are mentioned, Old Testament and New Testament, the orphans or the fatherless. Today we would say those would be kids who don't have parents. Maybe their parents died through an accident or an illness war. Maybe their parents are in prison. For whatever reason, they don't have parents with them. The widows, those would be maybe single parent homes where a spouse has died or a spouse through divorce is no longer in the picture. We have the strangers or the aliens. Now that's an interesting concept in scripture. The word in Hebrew, off for stranger, often used to refer to those who left their homeland perhaps because of famine or war. In Genesis 15, it says Abraham's descendants were to be strangers in Egypt because they had left their homeland and they were sojourning there. In Exodus 2, Moses named his son Gershom, which means a stranger in a foreign land because they were in that land of captivity. In Exodus 12, the strangers to the nation of Israel could partake of the heritage and join the Israelites and become a nation of the land. And in Exodus 22, they were told not to oppress the strangers in the land. And then we have the fourth category of the least of these, which would be the poor. And we know Jesus said, what? The poor you will always have mm -hmm. with you. Our memory text is Matthew 25, verse 34. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And if you read the context, why did they inherit the kingdom? One of the reasons, they ministered to the least of these. On Sunday's lesson, we look at the life and ministry of Jesus. And we discover, remember the Jews thought what? Jesus was coming to proclaim himself king and he would overthrow the Roman oppression. 
But yet Jesus came to minister unto the least of these. Let's read his mission statement. That's actually my lesson on Sunday is Jesus' mission statement. We find it in Luke chapter 4. Let's turn there. We're going to read Luke chapter 4. We pick it up in verse 16. This is Jesus' messianic ministry being announced, or you could say his mission statement for coming to this world. He chose to announce his ministry of preaching, of healing, of liberty here in Nazareth. We're in Luke 4, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. He was very well known by this time. In fact, verse 14 says that he had returned from Galilee and the news of him went out through all the surrounding regions. So Jesus was well known and the hometown boy, I say that with the most respect, but that's what we would say. He came home for a visit. He came to Nazareth and the people had heard of his miracles and they had seen what he had done. And then he comes in to the synagogue. And what happens? Verse 17, he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And here we see coming forward his mission statement. Of course, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 61. In verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Before we go any further, I just want to stop at that word, anointed me. Remember Jesus at his baptism, what happened? The Holy Spirit descended like a dove in bodily form upon him. He was, you could say, anointed with the Spirit for his mission. Peter in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, he's speaking to Cornelius and he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Anointing is essential for service. We cannot work effectively for God without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, we know Jesus was filled with the Spirit from his birth in a special way because the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary with the conception of Jesus. And we know that. But in another fuller measure, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at his baptism. So Jesus is saying he has anointed me. He's speaking of himself, even though it's quoting the words back here from Isaiah, but he's speaking of himself. The Holy Spirit anointed him for his mission. And what was that mission? We're going to talk about the sixfold mission of the Messiah. And for each one of those points, we have a takeaway. So let's jump into the sixfold mission. What was his mission? Number one, to preach the gospel to the poor. In Greek, the word poor means one who crouches and cowers, one who is deeply destitute. Takeaway number one, the gospel is for those who need it most. The gospel is for the least of these. The gospel is for the orphans, for the widows, for the strangers, for the fatherless. The gospel is for the poor. Jesus came for those who were deeply destitute. He came for me. He came for you. Let's look at the second uh, part of his mission. Not only did he come to preach the gospel to the poor, he came to heal the broken hearted. Now that word in Greek means to break in pieces, to crush, literally or figuratively to scatter those pieces. The gospel, takeaway number two, the gospel is for the broken. Jesus came for the broken. Those who are broken emotionally, those who are broken spiritually, he came. Remember when in, he cast out the money changers in the temple? Mm -hmm. Remember that story? And all those people who thought that they were something and thought that they were worth, worthy, they left. But it was the poor who stayed. It was the needy who stayed. It was the destitute who stayed. Those were the ones. Of course, he came for all, but those were the ones who received him. Uh, part three of his sixfold mission to proclaim liberty to the captives. Mm -hmm. Now, this word is fascinating to me. That word liberty in Greek means deliverance or forgiveness. And almost every time, if you look almost every time it is translated in the New Testament, it's translated forgiveness. Now, if you understand that in context to proclaim liberty to the captives, what does that mean? You and I are bound stuck in addiction and sin. And Jesus came 
to give us forgiveness. Right. Jesus came to set us free. The captive, it's amazing to me. The word means a prisoner of war, to buy back. You know, you mm. think about how he redeemed us right. and bought us back. Takeaway number three, the gospel, it's for the sinful. Jesus came to offer forgiveness. We know all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let's look at the fourth part of his mission, to grant recovery of sight to the blind. Now that blind sometimes is translated in Greek physical blindness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's translated spiritual blindness, like when Jesus talked about the Pharisees and Sadducees being blind or blind guides. So either way, the gospel is for those who cannot see. Jesus came to heal us of our spiritual blindness. He didn't just come to take away our sin and to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from that. He came to open our eyes so that we could see, so that we could know, so that we could understand and comprehend truth. You know, without Jesus, we can't understand the Word of God without the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned and it takes that to understand that, to, o to open our eyes spiritually. Let's look at the fifth aspect, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now I told you Jesus was quoting from Isaiah 61 and the previous section is, but this section is from Isaiah chapter 58. To set at liberty those who are oppressed, the word liberty is the same word used before. It means forgiveness or that liberty or setting free. So to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Oppressed is translated to crush, bruise, oppressed. In Isaiah 42 verse four, it is translated discouraged. So you know what my takeaway is from this number five? The gospel is for the bruised. The gospel is for the crushed. Mm -hmm. The gospel is for the discouraged. If you say, I don't even know a way out. I don't even know what to do. Jesus came to set you free. Right. Finally, the last part, part number six. He came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is an allusion to the year of Jubilee, which would be the 50th year, the year of universal release for persons and property, the year when the slaves were set free and the debts were forgiven and the land returned to its original owner. Jesus was saying, what's the final takeaway? The gospel is now. He's saying that my time is now. I am here now as your Messiah. God's grace is for now. God's forgiveness is for now. His deliverance from sin is for now. So what an incredible gift. He did not come to break the oppressor's yoke as in, yoke, as in from Rome, but he came to deliver us all and to set us free. Amen, wow. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill, for that. I appreciate it. Powerful truth, and uh, this lesson continues on with Monday's lesson entitled God's Provision for the Poor. There's so many rich counsels that we find in the Word of God that helps us to come to understand God's heart on these issues. And, you know, God's heart on these issues and how He sees it, how He views it, uh, should also be ours. If we are in relationship with Him and we're growing in Him and we are coming in full harmony with His plan and His will for our life, we also should be sharing in the heart of the Lord, especially in our relationship and our interactions and our thoughts towards others. God's provision for the poor. As I was studying this lesson, um, it brought me back to some of my own experiences. You know, there are different levels of poverty or different levels of poor. And, uh, you know, there are those that in the extreme cases are literally homeless. And, uh, you know, you can see these very uh, extreme situations if you just go to some of the big cities in, in the world, some of the big cities even here in the United States. Uh, but then there's the, you know, maybe not so extreme, but yet still uh, levels of poverty that exist out there. For instance, there are people that are not necessarily homeless, but yet they have hit some misfortunes or for whatever reason, they're in a situation in which they're living in, in an extreme poverty level or in a, a level of poverty that uh, is is on the lower level of things. I guess I should say it like that. Um, it brought me back to a little bit of a, a time in my life when I and my family experienced uh, some levels of poverty. And, um, you know, there was a time and, you know, my parents 
growing up, my parents were extremely, extremely hard workers, and they instilled that within me and my brother and my sister. Uh, they taught us what it meant to work hard. They, they taught us to work hard. They taught us to be honest, to give our all, to do everything, not have in a half-hearted way, uh, not to do things, you know, in, in, you know, to start something and not finish it, to, but to finish it, to do it the right way and do it the best way and the most efficient way. And so, you know, I watched as both of my parents just labored very hard. They were very hard workers all their life. Well, this ultimately led to a time in which both of my parents were declared disabled because my dad had had a string of, of surgeries. My mom had had a string of surgeries and this was in my, you know, latter years of high school. And, and uh, you know, my dad and my mom usually worked and I worked as I got a little older, but there came a time when I was the only one working in the house and also going to school. And so, it, it, you know, making a less, less than ten to $15,000 a year, which is, you know, again, an extreme poverty level in, in terms of, you know, what Americans make in regards to an income. But, you know, I say all of that because there were times when I remember, you know, we didn't know where the money was going to come from for, you know, come for them to keep the lights on. We didn't know where the money was going to come, you know, for the, sometimes for the next day's meal, even though God, we knew God would provide, but there was times we're like, you know what, where are we, how are we going to eat tomorrow? We don't, we don't have enough money, but, uh, but you know, it's amazing. God always came through, but we still lived in a situation where it was like, where, where are these things going to come? Because we were in a situation where I was the only one working and my money, my salary was not enough to provide. Uh, there were times when we were wondering, you know, when, when, well, how are we going to put gas in the vehicle to get to here, to get to there, or get to school or wherever it was we were going. And, and of course, some misfortunes and some misunderstandings led to a point in time in which there was a cop showing up at our door, serving papers and threatening to take away our home and threatening to take away our vehicles. And, and every time we would hear a knock at the door, you know, my heart would sink as I think, oh no, is it that cop again coming to threaten to take away our belongings? Uh, you know, but if it wasn't for friends and family and others uh, that God had placed in our life to help us through this time of of trouble, this time of trial for us and difficulty, you know, praise God that there are people out there that understand God's heart on this issue. I just want to read through a few texts in scripture uh, and, and just share with you what the Bible teaches on this subject because God has commanded us. He has, he has counseled us and told us how we should make provisions for the poor and how we should relate and treat those who are less fortunate than we are. Exodus chapter 23 verses 10 and 11, the Bible says this, it says, uh, again, this is Exodus 23, verses 10 and 11. It says, Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, and the poor of your people shall eat. And what they leave, the beast of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. So here God is saying, look, you know, it's not all for you. It's not all for just your business and for your personal gain. Leave a little bit for someone else who might be less fortunate than you. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 22. Again, Leviticus 23, verse 22. It says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corner of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So again, God telling his people, you're my people. You're my beacons of light to this world. I want you to be those people who are compassionate for your brothers and sisters who are poor and who are less fortunate than you. When you go out and gather that harvest, don't gather at all. Leave the corners there so that people can come around and they can gather some food for them and their families in their home. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 11. It says, for the poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you saying, you shall open your hand while, while, uh, wide to your brother. So you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. So these are just some general principles that God uh, instilled within his people and commanded and counseled his people to do. Uh, also, we have a responsibility, not just for the physical needs, but just the needs in general to be there, to represent and to stand up for those in need. Psalm chapter 82, verse Verses three and four makes it very clear. It says, defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. You know what? We are to treat others the way we would want to be treated. And I could tell you being on, again, I'm not going to go as far as to say that we were homeless and that we were in the extreme, extreme extremes. But I've been in a situation and I have a heart for people who, who because I've been there and I know what it's like. Um, and the, the lesson just goes on and brings that. It says, then there are promises to those who help the needy. And it gives for Proverbs 28 verse 27, which says, he 
he who gives to the poor will not lack. That's a beautiful promise. Uh, Proverbs 29, verse 14. I know these are rapid fire uh, scriptures, but just go with me on this. Ra Proverbs chapter 29, verse 14. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. And of course, the blessing also brings out, and King David noted in Psalm chapter 41, verse 1, blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So these are promises that are given to us if we will share in the heart of God on these issues. It goes on to say this then always had been a priority in ancient Israel, even if at times it had been lost sight of. In contrast, though, I get this and this really this really hit home. In contrast, even in modern times, particularly in England, Western Europe, under the impact of what was known as social Darwinism, many thought that not only was there no moral imperative to help the poor, but that it was in fact wrong to do so. When I read this, my mind immediately went to, you know, I've met a lot of Christians with this mindset, professed Christians, I'll say that. I've met a lot of people in this culture, especially in our time. We have this mentality, well, they need to help themselves. And so we don't need to help these individuals because they have a problem, they're just lazy. Now, are there, is it truthful that there are some lazy people out there that need to get up and do something for themselves and to provide for themselves and their family? Absolutely. And so I'm not saying that you know everyone falls into this category but at the same time there are people in need out there that have experienced misfortunes that we cannot throw under the bus and put into the category that the, well I just need to help themselves it's it's wrong for me to help this person because I'm enabling them well that's not always the case I remember there was a time when me and my family were on EBT food stamps and that was a difficult thing because in my culture, especially in the South, you'd hear people say, well, you know, them people on EBT, I'm just paying for their groceries. And I'm just, and they have all these ideas where it's, it's, this, it's a harsh mentality of I'm the one paying to support this family and my tax dollars are going to help these people that could go out and get a job and do for themselves. Well, you know what? I could tell you with absolute certainty that we were a hardworking family. We went through some misfortunes and praise God for them EBT food stamps during the time that they were provided to us and given to us that it was a very much of a help. Now, praise God, God also brought us out of that because the happy ending of the story is there came a time in which my father was able to gain a little bit better health. My mother was able to gain a little bit better health. I was able to become of age where I could get a better job. And we let go of those food stamps because we no longer needed them. And God brought us out of that through blessings down the road. But my friends, we have to understand that the Bible does not have, does not place upon us this mentality always for those who are in the poor that everyone should just help themselves and figure out their own problems. God has placed us there to be a blessing to others and to give and share the heart of the Lord and being there for them when they are needed. Instead, it says, following the forces of nature in which the strong survive at the expense of the weak, social Dar Darwinists believe that it, is, it would be deter uh, detrimental to, to society to help the poor, the sickly, the uh, indigent, because if they multiplied, they would only weaken the social fabric of the nation as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is just a quote thinking. This is not the heart of God. You know, and I, I had another passage I was going to read, but I don't have enough time. But go read Revelation 18. <laughs> go read Revelation 18 and look and see how God will bring punishment upon those in the end who have built wealth off of, off of the lower class people, who built wealth off the needy and who have, you know, just hoarded all the riches and all the wealth for themselves and not sharing. They, they will meet their demise. My friends, God has called us to love one another as we love ourselves and as He loves us. And that, my friends, is what we see here in Monday's lesson. God's provision for the poor. Let us read the Bible and let us bring our lives in harmony with his counsel. Amen. Thank you so much, Ryan. What a wonderful reminder to each one of us. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to lesson number seven, our study on unto the least of these. And we continue the study with Pastor John Lomacain. Yes, and I'm talking about the rich young ruler, which describes our society today. Young people are rich in things that they don't recognize, like health mm -hmm. and strength, and they are wasting their wealth 
on a world that's just sapping the God-given riches from them, much like the rich young ruler. He had many things. Let's go to Mark chapter 10 and peek into his story. Matter of fact, Mark 10, let's go to Matthew 19. I actually like Matthew 19. There's so many parallels in the story of the rich young ruler that we could identify with uh, regardless of our age. And this even bridges over into one of the commandments, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But let's pick up the story in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 21. And behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The first takeaway or the first application is this. There's a presumption that or an assumption that there's something good that we can do. Mm. You know, like people say, why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> well, I've said that's a presumption to think that we're all good, but there's none that are good, no, not one. And so when he talked about that, he came with the mentality that there's something he can do to contribute to his standing before God. So let me lay that fallacy aside. There's nothing we can do, nothing, no good thing we can do to contribute to our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith yes. and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And this young man, being a Jewish young man, should have known that. But that's what happens when you are possessed by your possessions. It clouds your understanding, thinking that I did all this to gain all this. There must be something that I can do to gain something even more valuable, which is eternal life. The story picks up in the next verse. Verse 17, so he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. I could spend a lot of time on 17. Jesus was introducing to him the God that he thought about as just the teacher. He says, there must be a reason you're calling me good. Are you recognizing something in me that's greater than the rabbis? And Jesus is in essence saying to him, this is in fact true, but I'm not going to tell you I'm God. But in fact, I'm better than just a teacher. Verse 18, he said to him, which ones? And this is really a question that many Christians ask today. Which commandments do I need to keep? Right. Rather than keeping them all, right. which ones do I need to keep? There are those people that think the Sabbath is irrelevant. I don't have to keep that one to enter into eternal life because many people link that to works, but it's in fact not. And the Lord said to him, knowing this young man's heart, he made it clear and notice he didn't focus on the first four commandments because those were things that were very, very stringent among the Jewish people. They were very strict about keeping the commandments. The Lord focused on the issues of his heart. He says in the verse continuing, uh, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he focused on the social aspects of the Ten Commandments. Verse 20, the young man said to him, now don't notice this, his perfection came out. Mm. I'm just so spotless, Lord. All these things I have <laughs> kept from my youth. Why do I still lack? I mean, I've been very particular about keeping the commandments. You mean to tell me I've been so particular about the letter of the law? but there's a spirit of the law that's still, be, not, still being violated. The Lord was saying yes to him. Mm -hmm. So he says, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now this story caused a lot of consternation among the disciples. Those who were listening, they were thinking, well, this is really not, I mean, <laughs> you're making eternal life hard. Peter said, who then can be saved? The disciples, as a matter of fact, almost in chorus, well, who then can be saved? And the Lord said, you know, if you could leave houses and lands and mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers for my sake in the kingdom, and then I'm going I'm to bless you tremendously. You will have eternal life, but in this life, you'll have a hundred times more than you presently have. Let me put a pin in that. God can provide more for us than we can provide for ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this provisional aspect of our mindset, thinking that, well, if I get a really good job, a really good education, a really good position in a company, a really good house, a really good stand in the community, then all my needs are gonna be provided. God is saying, you can get all that and you still cannot beat my ability to provide for you. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what did Jesus mean when he said, if you wanna be perfect? This is where his possessions conflicted with his God 
because his possessions became his God. That's why he couldn't see beyond who Jesus really is. Now let's look at the impact, the impact of money and things above God. Matthew 19, verse 22, the impact comes out in verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away, how? Sorrowful, Mm -hmm. for he had great possessions. This is a very significant aspect, especially in the world we live in today. I mean, I've been around the world quite a bit, seen a lot of countries. And whenever I come back home, the thing I remember the most is either the, the, the amazing poverty or the opulent uh, luxury. I'm often impressed. Wow, that country hardly had anything. Wow, that country had just too much. We've, we are very few times in a place that is very perfectly balanced because the mindset, that's why it's important like us to live in the country because we got trees. <laughs> we got an abundance of trees. That's we right. could breathe clean oxygen. <laughs> Praise God for that. We don't walk out of our doors every day and think, let me go to the mall across the street. <laughs> no, across the street is a field. That's we right. don't even have a stoplight. <laughs> so it helps to kind of minimize the <laughs> mentality of possessions when you live out in the country. Sure. But the impact of it is verse 26, the impact of money on the things, on things the impact of money and things on salvation. Matthew, 9, Matthew 16, 26. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? When you're grasping for things, remember that passage. Even when it's brand new and shiny, in just a short period of time, it loses its impact on satisfaction. When a person is ill and near death, they don't say, I need more possessions. Mm -hmm. They're praying for more time. Don't let your possessions possess you. Secondly, uh, don't allow yourself to be covetous. Don't let your possessions covet you or covet your possessions. Let's look at a couple of examples. Luke 12 and verse 15. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. When you die and all that stuff is left behind, who are you going to give it to? Nobody ever went to the cemetery with a (laughs) U-Haul. Nobody ever got buried in a mausoleum of stuff. Now in Egypt, they did that but nobody was rowing boats when they got into that tomb. They That's turned right. to dust and those boats stayed there and stayed in those, those, those tombs for, for decades, for millennia, as it were. Possessions often affect people's lives. Like, for example, Abraham and Lot were affected by their possessions. Look at Genesis 13, verse 6. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great they could not dwell together. That's how it happens in some family members. Some homes are so packed with stuff. You move into somebody's house, you bring your stuff. I remember moving to Weaverville, not Weaverville, to Thompsonville here, and we were moving around from house to house until we finally got a place to live. We still have stuff in our barn that we haven't touched for 10 years (laughs) because we said, and somebody said, well, just throw it away. But the mindset is, well, my, we might throw away something that really is needed for us. Right. That's the impact of possessions. It also affected Isaac in the minds of the Philistines. Look at Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in the land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. In verse 13, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became prosperous. Notice, he began to prosper, became very prosperous until he prospered. Verse 14, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. That's what happens when your possessions possess you. People become envious of your possessions. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes to visit you, don't show them your stuff. Show them Christ. Amen. Amen. Also, Esau and Jacob had issues in this area. Look at Genesis 36, verse 6. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the persons of his household, his cattle and all his animals, and all his goods which he had gained in the land of Canaan, and went to a country away from the presence of his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together, and the lands where they were strangers could not support them because of their livestock, possessions possessing us. Mm-hmm. Third point. The deception of possessions. First Timothy 6, verse 17, verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. The prioritizing of possessions, Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And the divinity that brings to us the promise of our needs. Philippians 4, 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Here's the point. Don't let your possessions 
possess you. Mm. Amen. Very nice. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have to remember that. But okay. let your possessions possess you. And now we are on Wednesdays, a portion of the lesson, Zacchaeus. And that's the title of the lesson. And Zacchaeus was a wealthy Jew. He was very rich. And we take his story in Luke chapter 19. Please join me beginning in verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. The Bible says, now here we see something interesting. The, the, the co tax collectors or publicans, as you have also, they've been referred to, they were considered uh, that they had gained their riches through taking more than they were supposed to. And they were hated. They were hated, but here we have Zacchaeus, that he's a chief tax collector. So you may consider that if they hated the regular tax collectors, they hated him more because he was a chief tax collector. And notice how we see verse 3, and he sought to see who Jesus was, who could not because of the crowd, for he was a short he was of short stature, and perhaps some people are remembering that little song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. <laughs> and so because he was short of stature, it says in verse 4, uh, so he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. Who knows when the last time was that he climbed the tree, but because Jesus was coming by and he was eager to see him, it says that he ran up into and, and climbed up on a sycamore tree for he was going to pass by that way. He calculated his move and he was going to take a look at Jesus. Apparently he wasn't even interested in talking to him. He just wanted to see who Jesus was. And when Jesus came to the place, he stopped. Mm. He looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must stay at your house. Wow, <laughs> I love that part. What a wonderful thing to hear for Zacchaeus. He got even better than he hoped. Jesus coming to my house? He knew that people didn't really like him, but here comes Jesus to his house. You know, and I think Jesus wants to come to your house as well, wants to come to my house. And uh, would you do the same? Make haste and make preparations for Jesus. Now uh, it says there in verse six, so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Mm -hmm. But when they saw it, now here are the people, the people sometimes uh, create problems for us, don't they? So he, uh, when the people saw it, they all complained saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Now, isn't that interesting Love that it. sinners call other people sinners? <laughs> and, and apparently they're trying to say, well, we're not sinners. They are really saying he's worse than we are. Why is he going to their house? And I take you now to Luke chapter 5, because here's an interesting uh, story that we must consider as we talk about Zacchaeus. And we're also comparing a little bit the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus. Let's look at Luke chapter 5 really quick and begin in verse 27. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector, that's Jesus, uh, that he, was, uh, he saw a tax collector named Levi or Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up and followed him. That's Luke chapter 5. Uh, then Levi, uh, Levi or Levi uh, gave him a great feast at his own house, and there was a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Mm -hmm. Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mm -hmm. Love it. And That's this is why... Jesus went to the house of Zacchaeus. So as we consider uh, this story, we must uh, consider that Jesus went there not to have a good meal. Jesus went there because this man needed salvation. Amen. And the Bible doesn't tell us what, what conversation they had 
but it's uh, the result of Jesus being there tells you that it was a conversation that drew Zacchaeus to Jesus, drew Zacchaeus to Jesus to understand that he needed the salvation that Jesus came to offer. Now, let's go back uh, to Luke chapter 19 and go to verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Wow. Now this is a marvelous thing that he said. And notice uh, verse 9, and Jesus said to him, today, there must have been joy because the Bible says there's uh, joy, more joy in heaven over one sin that repents That's right. than over 99 who need no repentance. And Jesus surely was full of joy. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house hmm. because he also is a son of Abraham. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When Zacchaeus heard that, he must have rejoiced to understand, hey, you are accepted. You are a son of Abraham. That's right. hmm. And it says in verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hmm. Great rejoicing. The best thing that Zacchaeus could have ever done in his life, he did it on that day. Went to see Jesus. Went to find, made time to spend time with Jesus or to just uh, look at him. But here Jesus went further. You know, the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's right. Jesus knew that he would meet Zacchaeus that day. And this is a marvelous thing. Now I'm going to read to you from Desire of Ages, page 555. It says, no repentance is genuine that does not work reformation. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is the principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. Holiness is wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. Yeah. We don't have any record that Jesus says, hey, Zacchaeus, you're going to have to, you're going to have to turn, return things back and give fourfold. No, this came out of his heart. And we praise the Lord that Zacchaeus made that decision. Now, in the lesson, I'm going to read this from the lesson. It says, Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler had some things in common. Both were rich. Both wanted to see Jesus. And both wanted eternal life. But here, the similarities stop. And that's a very good point that the lesson brings out. And it says, and notice that when Zacchaeus said that he would give half of my goods, Luke 19, 8, to the poor, Jesus accepted this gesture as an expression of a true conversion experience. And the lesson brings this thing, thing out, and I think it's kind of cute, a little bit interesting. He, he didn't say to him, sorry, sack. But like the rich young ruler, it's all or nothing. <laughs> Half is not going to cut it. Why? You see, the rich young ruler, his God became his possessions. He let possessions possess him. Mm -hmm. That was his idol. But apparently to Zacchaeus, that was not an issue. That was not an issue for Zacchaeus. His possessions were not his God. When we look at Desire of Ages 555, we read this very powerful. When the rich young ruler had turned away from Jesus, the disciples had marveled at their master saying, how hard, notice I said rich young ruler. When the rich young ruler had turned away from Jesus, the disciples had marveled at the master saying, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? They had exclaimed one to another, who then can be saved? Now they had a demonstration of the truth of Christ's words. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Mark 10, 24 and 26 and Luke 18, 27. They saw how through the grace of God, a rich man could enter into the kingdom. So we see here that every single individual has the opportunity for salvation. We're talking about the least of these. Even people, the others say, oh, no, that person over there, 
can't be saved, impossible. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And today, Jesus continues to seek and to save that which was lost. We may not see him physically going from place to place, but in the person of his disciples, which you and we are, Jesus is seeking to save that which was lost. And I praise the Lord for 3ABN because through 3ABN, Jesus continues to seek and to save right. that which was lost. And if you have been a recipient of being saved through Jesus, through 3ABN, we want to hear about it. Give us a call or write us. Amen. Wow, I love the thoughts there about the rich young ruler and Zacchaeus because it reminds us that uh, while God loves the poor, God loves the rich. That's right. And uh, he certainly cares about each person that we have the same need. And so I, I lead us to another rich man. Consider the man Job. And there's a lot to consider in 42 chapters of spiritual wrestling with God over suffering. But it's in that spiritual wrestling with God that Job's character is revealed here. Now, I ask you, what would you love to hear God say about you? Uh, there's some things that God says in the Bible about people that we wouldn't want to hear, but uh, I, I don't care what others might say about me, but I want to know what God says about me. And so we find out what God says about Job here in chapter one. Uh, Satan, whose name means the adversary, has come into God's presence. We're not told exactly when or where this happens, but uh, uh, based on what God says here in chapter one, verse eight, we realize that he's making a claim that his kingdom of sinfulness and self is superior to God's kingdom and God's government of love and submission. And so God responds in chapter one, verse eight, saying, Lord God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And there's the title of the lesson. That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Oh man, that is the equivalent of well done, good and faithful servant. God points to Job and says, here's a person who has my righteousness. He's just like me. Well, Satan's unconvinced. He accuses God essentially of abusing his power and of buying Job's righteousness as if you could pay for a person to love you and to take on your righteousness. And, and so all of Job's physical uh, carnal prosperity is wiped away. And again, Satan comes before the Lord. And in chapter two, verse three, God points again to Job and says, have you considered my servant Job and repeats the same, uh, the, the same words there. So Job's righteousness was not based upon the things that he owned. God said, I look into his heart and I see that he loves me and he is displaying what I am like. Even when Job's wife says, why do you hold fast to your integrity in chapter two? Curse God and die. In verse 10 of chapter two, it says in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, Job doesn't hear these words spoken about him. He just does what is right because it is right. His blessings have not gone to his head. And this becomes then the backdrop for the conversation we're going to hear next. In Job chapter 29, verses 12 to 16, Job is, uh, uh, he's kind of looking into the past and saying, I, I long for the old days when I sat in the city gate, when the young and the old respected me and longed for my wisdom. But in verse 12, we see one of the other things that he longs for. I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor. And this phrase right here at the end of verse 16, I searched out the case I did not know. Mm. Job takes the initiative. He doesn't wait for someone to appear upon his doorstep. He goes out and looks for those who are in need. And if you're applying for a job and someone writes a reference letter for you, you want them to say, he takes initiative. He doesn't wait to be told what to do. He searches for what needs to be done. And Job here is just doing exactly what God does. Who's the good shepherd who goes out into the night searching for the sheep who's lost. 
Revelation 3, verse 20, uh, we find that Jesus comes to our door. He takes the initiative. He says, I'm standing at your door knocking and calling to you. And Job does the same because as 1 Peter says there in verse, chapter 1, verse 4, he is a partaker of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. He's simply displaying the characteristics of God that he has witnessed. He's not waiting for someone to appear at the, the window of his car with a cardboard sign. He is, in the words of Jesus, going out into the highways and the hedges, rolling up his sleeves to be eyes to the blind, feet to the lame. And I know sometimes we might say, Lord, I'm willing to serve you if you do all the work for me. If you plop it right here in my lap and make it impossible for me to step, uh, step around, then I'll, I'm willing to take the last step because I'm really kind of reluctant. Job, with the character of Christ, that he is allowed to fill him and cover him, that's not what he does. He does not do the bare minimum. He says, Lord, I'm going to go wherever you go. And I'm going to share with whoever it is that, that you help me to find. And he's not doing this because he read about it in Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Proverbs, which haven't been written about yet. He's doing it because of the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And that's what does it to us. Uh, the Spirit moves upon us and says, look at what I've given to you. I helped you when you were needy and I have help for you to share with others. So how can we look for those opportunities? It can be as simple as becoming familiar with uh, other outreach ministries in your church, in your city, other believers who already have a network of reaching out to those in need. And you then get on their email list so you can be encouraged by seeing what's happening and pray for, min for missionaries and ministers in other places and using your finances if God directs you. But a little closer to home, uh, I want to share from sixth volume of the testimonies, 296. It says, wherever there is a church established, all the members should engage actively in missionary work. They should visit every family in the neighborhood and know their spiritual condition. In our world today, we shut our blinds, uh, we, we stay in our homes, and we're unaware of some of the needs right there nearby us. But I would encourage you to begin by, by looking around and saying, I'm going to at least start praying for him. I may not know his name, but I'm going to pray for the man with the red car. I'm going to pray for the grumpy person who walks the dog and, and doesn't like children. And, and you put those names on your prayer list and say, Lord, help me to understand their needs and begin to then have the desire and willingness to reach out to them and talk to them. Maybe you're saying to yourself, I'm the poor and the needy. Uh, I, I don't have much to share with people who are in the same situation I am. And in most situations, those with limited resources, I found, really are quick to share with those who share their situation. And Jesus comes to share the lot of the poor. He who, be who was rich became poor for us. So caring for those who are less fortunate is more than just money. It's saying, Lord, put upon my heart the needs of the others. Help me to become aware of the needs around me so that I can begin by praying for them and maybe sharing an encouraging word or pointing others to the resources that I have found that have been useful and helpful to me. In all of this, we should keep in mind Romans chapter 13. And I love verse 8 of Romans 13. It says, Owe nothing to anyone. All right. And I know in a previous lesson, we talked about staying out of debt. And so Paul confirms that here, but he says, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Mm -hmm. Now, That's when right. we think about finances, we think about business, we want to be in the black. We don't want our accounts to plunge below zero and to be in debt. And, and, but when we think about our spiritual life, God says to us, I want you to recognize that you're always living in the red that you always have a debt that you cannot pay. Based upon the priceless gift that God has paid for you, you need to then pay it back, but recognize you can never pay it back. And we begin to pay it back by looking around us and saying, Lord, are there those around me who are also in need? I should not ever get to the point where I say, I'm even with God. Uh, I've, I've given my amount that then equals his sacrifice to me. Uh, listen to what Paul says in Romans 1, 14. He says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. Look at what God's given to me and I know it. And there are those out there who don't know it. It's not just their physical needs that need to be met, but their spiritual needs, those suffering. And, and as we meet the, the physical needs, it gives us opportunity to say, let me share with you what God has done for me. 
the gifts that he's given to me. And so Paul then tells us, I want to go to a place where no one's ever talked about Jesus before. And so we learn that he wants to go on to Spain, a place where nobody had ever been to share the good news of Jesus. A final point as we consider the man Job, take you to Job chapter 22, verse 6 and 7, and we're listening to Eliphaz, one of his friends. And listen to what he says in verse 6 and 7. For you, he's talking to Job now, for you have taken pledges from your brother for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have not given the weary water to drink and you have withheld bread from the hungry. Now, we've already heard God's testimony about Job, and maybe sometime in the past, Job had, had been like that, and his character had changed. But I want you to notice here that when we give and share with others, it may not get a response, a human response here on the earth. In fact, people might not even witness it, notice it, and it might be rep misrepresented. But God knows the heart, and we don't serve and we don't give for the accolades and the applause of others. We simply do it because of what God prompts us to do because of what he's done for us. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. What an incredible yes. study, Daniel. Thank Each God. one of you, Brother Johnny and Pastor John and Ryan, thank you for your study of the Word of God. You've blessed my heart today. I want yeah. to give you an opportunity for closing thoughts. Absolutely. You know, it, it simply all comes down to Philippians 2, verse 5 for me. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus had compassion on those who, who were in need and even had compassion on those who were maybe physically or, or, or carnally or worldly rich, but were spiritually lost. We should also share in that compassionate heart of Jesus Christ. Uh, you may miss your greatest opportunity for eternal life if you think that your possessions can contribute in the least to giving you eternal life. Be willing to let go of what possesses you so that Christ can possess you. Amen. Thank you so much. Ezekiel chapter 33, 15 says, If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. We see Zacchaeus not only was willing to give one, he was willing to give fourfold. This is evidence of genuine repentance. Praise the Lord. Opportunity for all is there in Jesus. Amen. Thank you. When we consider the man Job, we remember that he was simply wearing the character of Christ. He didn't see, seek out the needy because of his goodness, but because of God's goodness. And so when we consider the man Job, he points us to consider the son of man who came to seek and to save the lost. And that's where we should look. Amen. Thank you all so much. Just so grateful for this opportunity, this time we have to study together. And we love sharing this time with you at home. You are part of the 3ABN family. Whether the Lord has blessed you with much and he's asking you to share that with others, or whether you don't have so much and the Lord is going to bring someone to your doorstep to help move that forward. Know that we love you and we pray for you. I want to leave you with this verse. This is Hebrews 13, 16. Do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. What a blessing to submit our lives to God and to then share with those who are in need. Join us next week, lesson number eight, planning for success.